We were talking uh, about one thing, and that's redemption. Secrets of redemption revealed. And um, you remember there were three types of redemption in the Greek, three words for redemption in the Greek. And I don't want to bore you with um, the Greek, except to say, uh, you remember the first one was your purchased from the marketplace. Uh, the second word is stronger in the Greek. You're not only purchased from the marketplace, but you're taken off the, the marketplace and no longer for sale. And the third Greek word means you're not only purchased, taken off the marketplace and no longer for sale, but you're liberated and set free to live the way God intends you to live in the earth. And the three Greek words for redeemed, so important to understand. And we're quickened by the Holy Ghost, body, soul, and spirit, that we can live in freedom. And one of the problems is with a lot of people that they learn what are their legal rights. And if ever there was a curse in the earth, it was the kind of um, uh, word of faith ministry that brought people to know their rights without telling them their responsibilities. You have a responsibility. And it's not sufficient to know your legal right. You've got to know and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to be filled with his spirit. Otherwise, what you've got is dead religion rather than living reality. It's knowing the life of Christ within. And I find a lot of people, they learn rights that they have. And it becomes a curse to them. Uh, you've got a lot of teaching today where it seems that the preachers, all they want is prosperity. All they want is, um, you know, they want their next jet plane. They want their next... And you get on television and you listen to them to boasting as though that's Christianity. And people, they live not realizing that the gospel is about something else. I believe God wants to prosper us, don't you? He'll prosper the work of your hands. No work, no prosperity. Uh, the idea of just giving money to get is stupidity. It's not biblical. You've got to work. Uh, the reason poverty comes, Proverbs says, is a little sitting down, a little folding of your hands, and poverty comes. That's how poverty comes. In other words, people are lazy. If you don't work, you don't prosper. There is no magic. Well, we're not in a magic game. That's Christian voodoo. I don't believe in it. People telling people, give me 50 pounds and God will cancel all your debts. No, he won't. He'll make you 50 pounds more in debt if you're stupid enough to believe that contract. Is that plain? Hello? Uh, and people, they manipulate people, crooks. I like, um, I was over at a conference in, in um, Tulsa, uh, and Benny got up, Benny Hinn got up, and, and he said something that I like. 98% of American preachers no longer preach the gospel. And he said it was, a survey was done by, uh, I keep forgetting the guy's name, Rod Parsley, 98% don't preach the gospel anymore. What they preach is a story of uh, seeker-friendly. Uh, and, and, you know, all the churches in America have caught on. Don't offend anyone. Tell them it's all free. Tell them Jesus did it all. But don't mention the blood, don't mention the cross, don't mention repentance, and don't mention sin. You know, it's, you can help people. And you've got all the kind of uh, power of positive thinking dished out. The issue in life, as we looked at it on Friday, is sin. 
Jesus Christ came to save his people from their sin. S I N. And preachers don't like that anymore. There's alternative lifestyles. There's being politically correct, politically nice. Well, I'm not nice, I'm nasty. See? If you're a sinner, you're going to hell. Hell's a real place. And I want you not to go out of the church feeling comfortable. I want you to go out feeling as miserable as hell because then when you get there, you'll feel comfortable being miserable. Because <laughs> that's where you're going. And my Jesus has made a way whereby you don't have to go that route. He came to save us and redeem us. <laughs> but if you don't face the reality, the issues in life are not the issues of, of, you know, you need someone to talk to, someone to help. Hey, it's sin. That's the issue. If you've got no peace in your heart, you're at variance with God. If you've got no joy in your heart, you've got some problem. And your problem's with God. You're living contrary to him. It's called sin. If you go your own way, you're like um, Isaiah, the prophet said, prophesying to the children of Israel, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every man to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the issue was sin. The issue wasn't some uh, misunderstanding. Uh, you know, I feel differently. I've got a different idea. Bunkum. The real crux of the matter is sin. And when you deal with people, Jesus Christ came to save his people from there. Now, isn't that simple? Well, there's only one out there. Is that simple? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. So if you've got a problem in your mind, your problems... If you've got a problem in your heart, your problems... If you've got no peace, your problem... Now, is that plain? Now, you might like to say it's something else. But it's, you know, oh, it's my circumstance. No, it's sin. Uh, and people don't like that anymore. I, I'm amazed that the biggest churches in America, they don't like the idea of telling people where the problem is. You'll upset them. Well, it's my duty to upset you. You know, it's the foolishness of preaching that saves. And it's not some... Uh, notion, uh, uh, you no know, nice, polite. Anyway, it's against my nature to be polite. I have an ability to get under people's skin. It's a gift. I like it. Uh, Paul got under people's skin so much, all of Asia deserted him. After they heard the gospel, they all got mad. Why? Because he dealt with sin. And I didn't like sin getting dealt with. You see, if you're going to live independent from God, you're going to live independent for God, for God for all eternity. If you're going to go your own way, it's going to be for all eternity. If you're going to live God's way, it's from now. You've got to learn to live it. When you're born again, it's not a matter of having an experience and then I can do what I want. No, 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 no. Uh, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Who's going to do his will? You are. It's how you live every day. Coming into church doesn't make you a Christian. It's what you are when you walk out that door. How you live. Forget it if you're one of these people that think, I speak in tongues, I hold my hands up, I dance, I praise God. But if you live like a devil for the rest of the week, forget it. What you're doing is called hypocrisy. Because God notices the rest of the week. 
And we come here to praise God for his goodness, for his love. What we don't come here to do is to delude ourselves. We also, the word of God brings correction. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides between soul and spirit. It gets hold of people. It gets into people. They don't like it. Light manifests darkness. If someone's living in darkness, light's going to get at them. I like what Spurgeon said, great Baptist preacher. He said, you should either make people mad or glad. But if you leave them neutral, you've failed. You're no preacher. I want to stir people up and get them real mad. That's part of life. Or they'll be glad. They'll say, amen, I agree with that, I agree with that. And they go down, you can see their heads. And they don't look up, you know. And sometimes I catch them out. You shout, look up! And they look, and you catch them. Our God is a good God. He's not come to condemn us, come to save us. But I tell you what, salvation's real. Very real. When God saves, he saves the uttermost. I want to look at uh, some things. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. You know, uh, I sometimes just quote the book rather than reading it um, and turning everyone to it. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, speaking of the vision of Jesus Christ that was given to John. And do understand it that it was the vision that Jesus Christ had that was given to John. Very important to understand that. Uh, Christ knew exactly what was going to be. It says this in, in verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. And hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. Isn't that wonderful? I want you to notice something so important that people misquote. God has made us priests and kings to our God, not to each other. God has made us priests and kings to our God, not to each other. There is nothing worse or more abhorrent uh, than people who think they're made a king on the earth to other people, you're not. If someone wants to be a pastor, he becomes a servant. That's the way it is. And the whole notion of this kind of living like a king is delusion. We're priests and kings to our God. Amen? You understand that? There's a way to live. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And it's not license. Uh, one of the problems is people, they, they understand redemption and then they think it's license. No, if I'm a priest and a king to my God, then I better live according to his will. If I'm serving the king of kings and lord of lords, then I've got a responsibility in my life to do what he wants, not what I want. It's so important to understand. It's not a matter of 
well, you know, now I'm saved. Now I know I've got authority in Christ. I know that God will heal the sick and deliver the captive. I know he'll do miracles. I see him all the time. But I've got a responsibility. It's not my power. It's his power. Not there for us to use. It's not a money-making machine. It's there to honor him. We're priests and kings to our God. Let's turn to um, 2 Peter. And if you turn to 2 Peter, it expresses it very well. 2 Peter chapter 1. Two Peter chapter one and verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might get a jet plane, the best car, ten thousand dollar suit. What does it say? By these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's natural desire. In other words, hey, the whole purpose of the promises of God is that you might be a partaker of his nature. It's not there for you to get the goodies out of life. It's not there so you can live for yourself. It's not there so you can take advantage. We become partakers of the divine nature. The promises of God are there to produce in us the life of Christ. It's not there for us to think, right, now God's met me. Now I'm a son of God. Now I have rights. Now I have this. Now, and then use the very truths that should change your nature. Because you notice, if you become a partaker of the divine nature, you escape the corruption that's in the world. You escape the lusts that are in the world. You're not desiring the things of this earth. You're desiring the things and putting your treasure in heaven above. I tell people the thing is if God prospers you, he prospers you to extend his kingdom. He doesn't prosper you to extend yours. Else you end up like a foolish man and says, well, I've prospered. I'll build bigger barns. And God comes and said, thou fool, this night your soul required of you. We're here on this earth and we prosper to live more for him. To be able to do more things in the earth. I believe in it. With all my heart. Hey, we're here to let everyone know there's a savior. There's a sin sick world out there. There are people with no hope no direction, never heard the gospel, and we're put on this earth to make them aware of the truths of Jesus Christ. That's what our purpose in life is. And, and so Peter says, when he writes them, he said, hey, look, here it is, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. What are you going to do with them? That you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped corruption that is in the world. Now, we're partakers of a divine nature, exceeding great and precious promises given to us. Why? So our whole nature changes. <coughs> Wonderful. Uh, you're not a two-nature person. You know, this bit of me's. Uh, sinful and this bit of me and I'm fighting one against the other if you've got that get born again you're not born again Ephesians 2 
And verse 1, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verse 1. Look at this. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now look, if you're walking according to this world's principles, you've got a problem. See, God intends you to have a divine nature, to be a partaker of divine nature. You can't mix the two. And he makes it quite plain. He says, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And if you're walking according to the course of this world, you're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Those who are against the gospel, those are against the nature of God. He goes on, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation, manner of life in time past, in the desires of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. See, it's to do with nature. And then he goes on, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, that's made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, he's done it by grace. You don't deserve it. He did it 2,000 years ago. It's done. It's a done deal. We don't live according to this world. We don't live according to the principles of this world, the ways of this world. We came out of the world. We're still in it, but we're not of it. We have a totally different nature. We have a totally different way of thinking. We have a totally different way of living. We're Christians. We're not driven by natural desires. We're not driven by desires of the flesh. We're not di driven by desires of the eyes. And the pride of life doesn't trap us. What we want is to live right according to God's nature. And the exceeding great and precious promises are given us so we can. Is that plain? Hello. Have you got it? Have you got it? Are you sure? Yes. So if you live according to things and you live according to this world, you're on your way to hell. <laughs> That's it. Paul had it right. You know, um, by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amen? God's foreordained that we should walk in good works. We're saved by grace. I want to repeat it, especially for visitors. I, I hear so many evangelicals who don't know God say, what God wants is you to give your life to him. He doesn't want your stinking life. What God wants to do is give you his life. It's the life of Christ inside. 
Lots of people, oh, I come and lay my life down. Thank you very much. Look, the nature of a sinner is not very helpful to God. You've got to become a partaker of a divine nature. You need the life of Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> is that correct? You know, a Christian life is a man who has Christ in him. He's a partaker of a divine nature. Uh, to be a religious man, you live the best you can. To be a Christian, you say, hey, I live, nevertheless not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's what the Bible teaches. It's his life, his power, his glory, his way, his nature, his mind, his thoughts. That's Christianity. Religion says, oh, you've got to struggle. Oh, woe is me. Oh, that which I would not, that I do. That's not Christianity. That's unregenerate. You still haven't switched natures. You don't know the precious promises that have been given us. Jesus Christ, same yesterday, today, and forever. When he comes inside, everything changes. You know, you know we've got to become partakers of the divine nature. We've got to do the right things. And that's where the conflict comes. Until you're born from above and the Holy Ghost has met you, it's a struggle. Until you realize the redemption and the truth of redemption and what you're redeemed from, you, you fight, you struggle. But oh, when you understand he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him, it's his righteousness. Not mine. I don't have to go about to establish my righteousness. I just have to go about in willing obedience to him. I want to do thy will. In the volume of the book it is written of me, I come to do thy will, O God. I just want to go his way. Is that plain? God intends our nature to change. God intends everything within us to change. And he doesn't intend us just to live for ourselves. He intends us to live for him. Look on in the scripture, okay? Let's go to, to John, um, John 20. John's Gospel, chapter 20. Hey, it's all in the book. John 20. Uh, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, life through his name means life through his nature. You can only have life because Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He came to give me life and life more abundant. When it talks about life, it's not living in the world's way, it's living God's way. Life is in God, death is in sin. And I've got to make a choice. Am I going to live the right way or the wrong way? Every single one of us has a choice. Jesus did many, many miracles. I find so often people... Uh, talk about um, miracles as though Jesus was limited. Jesus raised many of the dead. Jesus healed many sick. Jesus ministered to multitudes. And they're not all recorded in this book. And it says there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain everything he did. But what it has happened is they've taken out illustrations but remember this, Jesus only ministered in the Old Covenant. And that's why it says in Scripture, and Jesus said, that greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. What are the greater works? There was no one ever born again till Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Ghost was poured out. 
The greatest work of all is a work of regeneration. If you're one of these people that believes you're going to uh, raise some Lazarus from the dead who's been in the tomb, uh, and that's a greater work. No, the greatest work of all is the work of regeneration. By the foolishness of preaching, men hear. And it was plural. You think about it. Jesus was one. He walked about, he appointed disciples, but he was just one man. Now, today, all over the world, you've got ministries raised up, who tremendous ministries. Miracles, healings, uh, the gospels going out over television. Hey, we're reaching a lot of people. In, in, in um, China now, in one province, there's over 60 million spirit-filled Christians. God's moving by his spirit. You go to Africa, to Nigeria, there's hundreds of thousands coming in to life. We reach out across the airwaves. Our programs go out. They reach into Russia. They reach across Asia. They reach down into all Eastern European countries. They reach across Europe. Hey, they're hearing. Now, Jesus didn't have that. He just walked amongst the multitude. He only came to the children of Israel. But we're for every tribe, kindred, and nation. I don't like it when I see a black church in London. It bothers me. I don't like it when I see a white church because we should be of every tribe, kindred, and nation. And the gospel of Jesus Christ unites everyone under one kingdom. It's his kingdom. I love what my dear friend Archbishop Benson Ederhoser said um, and kept saying when he came to England. He wouldn't visit black churches. He used to say to me, brother, he said, if I want to preach to black people, I go to Africa. There's more of them. I want to reach the white man. I want to reach the European. That's why he came. Amen? <laughs> you know, when we allow racism, and I'll tell you this, I go across to America, and whether it's North America or South America, wherever it is, um, you know, in the states, southern states, northern states, segregation's alive and strong. You find it every Sunday morning. It's wrong. Christianity is for everyone. I want you to understand something. I think it's, it's become so, so real to me. Uh, and I've said it in the church before, and I'll always repeat it. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Probably the greatest thing you can ever know. Look, blessed, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. One of the things, we're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You're seated in heavenly places. Now don't say that's positional, that's fact. Uh, I, the number of pastors that come to me, I was over um, at um, the... Uh, I was over at the um, Thanksgiving service for Evelyn Roberts, Oral Roberts' wife, when she passed home to glory. I was invited there. I, and I was up in having lunch with some of the leaders from around the world. And, and one of them came to me and he said, oh, Bishop, Bishop, he said, come, pray with me. I said, what for? And he said, well, I, I, need, I need an anointing. I said, what for? And he said, well, I, I, I need to be anointed because I've got to speak this afternoon at the memorial service. I'm one of the speakers. He said, Bishop, I really need you to pray for me. So I looked at him and I said, no, I won't. He said, why not? 
I said, because if I pray for you to have an anointing, we're going to have to listen to you. But I would rather listen to the anointed one who lives within you. His name is Jesus. And as long as he's speaking, we'll all be blessed. He, looked, he was a word of faith man. He looked at me. I said, the only anointing... You know, Jesus is anointed to heal the sick, deliver the captive, open blind eyes. If you're doing it, we're in trouble. It's the life of Christ inside. He's the anointed one. I, that where's this nonsense of, you know, you, the anointing that breaks the yoke is God's anointing, not yours. People all come, oh, you know, pray for me. We all fall down. Now, I pray for people, they fall under the power, but I've never fallen under the power, and I never will. And I tell people the reason I will never fall under the power is because I know the scripture. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. And I can stand. I stand on the rock. Uh, now, you know, I don't mind someone falling if they get up healed. But I do object to them falling over if they get up and nothing's happened. Then I wonder, why do they fall? Pastor who was at the meeting here came to me and he said, please pray for me. I need more of Jesus. I said, I can't. I said, why not? I said, Jesus is a person. You can't have more of him or less of him. Either he's there or he's not. Oh, you know, I need more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a liquid. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'm a leaky vessel. As though God's dribbling out of the side of you. Grow up. God is a person. It's three persons in one God. Makes me so angry. Oh, here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up. Oh, come. That's not Christianity. Christ's in you. Redemption's about the reality of a living God living within you. It's not trying to reach up to heaven. In Romans chapter 10 it says... Don't re try and reach up into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Don't reach down below. That's to bring him up from the dead. What saith it? The word is nigh thee. In thy heart and in thy mouth. That is the word of faith which we preach. Amen? The idea, people are always looking outward. You've got everything in sight. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. There's nothing more. They're all trying to get a bit more. I'd like a bit more of Jesus. What, another foot? Head? Toe? Oh, he's a person. It's just the world's way of thinking, not God's. I like what T.L. Osborne, my dear friend T.L. says. He said, you know, he got baptized in the Holy Ghost 58 years. Well, 68 years ago, I can never remember, I think 68 years ago, he said, and for the day, he's never needed another anointing. He's never needed another experience. I mean, once you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're full. Uh, and we receive, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Have you got hold of that? You understand what I mean? Right, let's go on. You know, the Bible makes it, it's so simple. Why do Christians make it complicated? It's their gift. Verse 9. Oh, look, the verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Look, if you have to go and confess your sins every day, and you keep bringing up sins. My Bible says that we have forgiveness of sins through his blood that was shed 2,000 years ago. Okay? The moment God forgives, he forgets. He divides our sin as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he'll remember it no more. So if you go to God and you confess something that he's already forgiven you for, he'll say to you, what on earth are you talking about? Because he chooses not to remember. Forgiveness is once and for all. It's not, oh, you've got to come 
like the Anglican, oh, miserable sinner, earn stray from thy ways like lost sheep, get born again. Um, you know, left undone those things we ought to have done and done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no good in us. That, that's a sinner's prayer, not a Christian prayer. We get born again. You don't have a past, you have a future. You know, you sin. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. That, that's Christianity. Sin's done away with. We're forgiven. It's the sin nature that's changed. God forgives us, and... and the, the, the problem we have in, in society is, is it's amateur psychology. Hey, I don't remember what I did wrong. What I do know is Jesus took it all. He became sin who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God through him, and my past went. I had a, I had a future. We're born again, and we're born free. And I don't have to go back and worry what my grandfather did and my grandmother did and my great aunt Ethel did. I was born free. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. All things are passed away, all things become new, and all things are of God. That's new birth. Now that's what the Bible teaches. And generational curses do not exist except for those in Deuteronomy, the haters of God. And in Isaiah, it makes it very plain that the father will eat sour grapes, the children's teeth will not be set on edge. The new covenant's got better promises than the old covenant. Amen? What my father did can't affect me. What my mother did can't affect me. Wonderful. I'm born. Let's go on. There's, there's a, I haven't got the scripture I wanted to read out. Okay. Here. Look. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both, both of which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Do you believe that? It's the counsel of his own will. That's how he's working it out. That's why it's so important to live according to the will of God. Redemption puts a responsibility on me to live according to his will. I've got to do what he wants. Goes on. Uh, verse 15. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us would who believe according to the working of his mighty power now you want to know what that power is it tells you which he roared in christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all to the church now look back it's this that i love 
And what is the exceeding greatness, verse 19, of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Do you realize that in you, in each one of you, if you're a Christian, the power that's inside of you is the power that brought Jesus Christ out of the tomb. The power of God the Father that raised up the Lord Jesus Christ when he was pierced through, when his side was pierced through, when his heart was broken, when every bone was out of joint, when he was lay there three days dead in the tomb, the power that came and quickened his body, the power that caused every bone to go back in the joint, the power that raised him up from that tomb is the same power that works in you if you're a Christian. Can I repeat that? Because I don't think you understood me. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the power that quickened his body, that caused every bone to go back in the joint, that caused the, the bowels that were melted to go back into their normal shape, the power of life came back to Jesus Christ. And that same power that worked in him when God raised him from the dead is the power that operates in you. I don't think you understand me. The power that so infused the body, the dead body of Jesus Christ after three days in the tomb, the power that quickened his whole being, the power that caused every bone to go back into joint, the power that caused his eyes to open, his mind to come alive, his lungs to breathe, his heart to beat. The power that brought life back to the living Christ is the same power that today works in you. Have you got hold of that? And so, Christ in you is the hope of glory. You have that power inside of you. And you know, that's why we can do exploits. <laughs> that's why we can live. Hey, if you realize the power that's really available to you, providing, and this is the only proviso, you walk according to the will of God. The only proviso. <laughs> you walk. In fellowship with him, you do what he desires. That power is available to you in everything. And you know that power, that power just flows. I've seen it. I've seen God raise up people nigh unto death in a second. I was over in Richmond in New York, and they brought in a woman who was dying of, of um, AIDS. And she had lost all her bodily function. She would got pneumonia, and they said that they wouldn't let her come out of hospital. So they brought her out of intensive care unit in a bed, and they sent four doctors in the ambulance with her. And they said she'd be dead if you move her. And they said, well, she'll be dead if we don't move her. So they brought her to the meeting. And when I got to the meeting, I was going to preach. The bed was shaking so much because she was in a high fever that everything was rattling. There were tubes and bags going into her body and everything. So I said, push her out into the hall. She can hear the word of God. The hall's warm. Push her out there so it doesn't disturb everyone. I won't pray till I've preached. Because you see, he sent forth his word and healed them. The gospel's a healing. Now, she couldn't understand. She lost her mind. So I preached. And I pushed this bed up. Uh, same thing, you know, oxygen tent, tubes, everything. So I opened it. 
And once again, once I put my hand on her, she started to struggle. <laughs> you know, power of God hit her. Actually, it was my weight pushing her back, but I, I held her down. And I prayed. Very short prayer. Because I believe that. You know, I never fast and pray. I pray fast. It gets things done. And, and so, quick prayer. And I zipped up the tent. And I got on praying for other people, and suddenly I heard a big commotion behind me. And this woman who had pneumonia and was dying, and they had nothing they could do for it, four doctors with her, she suddenly sat up in her bed, and to the horror of everyone, she started pulling all the tubes out. And when she pulled all the tubes out, she unzips the oxygen tent, gets out of bed, and she's only in the night, and starts running up and down, completely healed. And I, I just got on with it, praying for the other people, and everything was going fine. And I got near the end of the line of the people I was praying for, and suddenly I get a tap on the shoulders. And there's two new, well, they were New York police officers. Guns, uniform, and everything. They said, um, are you the man that prayed for that woman in the bed over there? I said, yeah. Where is she? I said, I don't know. So I've got four doctors here that say you've kidnapped her. We can't find her anywhere. You'll have to come with us. I said, I'm not coming with you. I'm praying for the sick. They said, well, where is she? I said, look, you better go and find out. I don't know. I was praying for people. I know nothing about it. I'll tell you what had happened. Her relatives that had got her out of the hospital threw a blanket round her shoulder. When the police went round to her home, they found her sitting eating dinner at home. A woman who couldn't eat, couldn't think, all her bodily functions gone, her mind gone. She went back a week later. She wasn't even HIV positive. Jesus Christ is the healer. Amen. He's a good God. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that works in you. And when you know he lives in you, I'm not a miracle worker. I'm not a healer. I've never healed anyone. But I know someone who is. His name is Jesus. And he lives in me. And he lives in you. And there's nothing he won't do for you. He loves you. You have authority. If you'll do his will. If you work according to his purposes, everything will work for, together for good. If you work for your purpose, you'll cause destruction. That's the way it is. What a God we serve. What a redemption we have. What a hope we have. Hey, he's a good God, isn't he?